Good day everyone. Today we are going to get started on the scattering part of the course. Scattering is a fundamental process for studying potentials and structure of atoms and nuclei, but also uh, biological materials and solids and so on. But we're going to just concentrate on scattering from a single point source like an atom or a nucleus, rather than considering the more complicated cases that I just mentioned. We'll start by considering a classical point particle, which is in an experiment where we send it towards uh, some scattering potential, which is what we want to know more about, and perhaps that particle gets scattered. And this is the kind of picture that we're talking about. You've got an in a particle here at some impact parameter B. This is an entirely classical picture, I mind you. So it comes in, it gets scattered at some angle, and if you're far enough away, the fact that it may be scattered and this doesn't come exactly from the scattering center won't really matter. Once you're far enough away, this distance is going to seem very, very small indeed. So this is our basic setup um, for the classical problem. And we're going to start with the classical picture and then we're going to develop the quantum geometry. In this lecture, we're just going to talk about the geometry. We're not really going to do any complicated quantum physics. So in a general experiment, what you're going to have is a bunch of incoming particles and uh, some of them will get scattered at various angles. And that probability of scattering or you know, the, the amount of flux that gets scattered to an angle theta is called the differential cross section. Now, this is usually denoted as d sigma d omega, uh, but Griffiths used a slightly different notation. He writes it as d theta, which is actually just to recognize the fact that the differential cross section is not really a differential at all. It's just it's really just this the amount or the, the number or the probability of particles getting scattered into some solid angle d omega at the azimuthal angle theta. So let me just draw that. So according to this picture, what you have is you have some proportion of the incoming particles, which are the ones that fall within this little blue uh, region here, this little area, D sigma, they come in and some of them will get scattered and some of them will go through this little uh, piece of solid angle, D omega. And so the amount of these uh, incoming particles in D sigma that ends up going through D omega is the differential cross section. So you can write something like this or and that's you know that's where the notation d sigma d omega comes from. But it's not really a differential. And this is just expressing the areas d sigma, which is this area here, in terms of uh, cylindrical coordinates. And I express uh, d omega over here in spherical coordinates. So this is an expression for the differential cross section. And in this course, we're always going to assume that the scattering potential is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. And so the phi will not change for the particle during the scattering process. The first example that we would like to talk about and uh, remember that we're starting with classical physics here is we're just going to talk about the hard sphere. So the hard sphere is a excellent uh, starting point to just understand exactly what the geometry actually means. So there's our hard sphere, it has a radius of r, and our point particle is going to come in, hit the sphere, and then scatter off in some direction. Our impact parameter is b here. 
and we can just draw a little bit more to describe the, uh, the sort of physics of the reflection. And it's just classical physics here. So I'm just write some values of alpha. And this is the angle that it gets scattered by here, theta. And if I look closely at this triangle here, I can write some of the angles inside the triangle. And I can also see that So this gives me an expression for B in terms of theta or theta in terms of B. So I can write, for example, that theta equals two inverse cos of B over R if B is less than or equal to R and it's zero if B is greater than R, in other words, if it misses the hard sphere. And so we have uh, an expression for the scattering angle theta as a function of the impact parameter. But moreover, we can now talk about dBd theta, which we're going to need to put into our uh, differential scattering formula here. So the differential cross section here is B over sine theta times the absolute value of dBd theta, which we've just worked out. So I should replace that B here already with the expression R cos theta of two. And cos theta of two sine theta over two is two uh, sine theta, sorry, half sine theta. And so this is just R squared over four. Unusually in this case, it does, it does not depend on theta, that, but that's not usually the case. What this is basically saying is that you're equally likely to scatter in any direction theta. And so that's very unusual. It's just a effect of the particular geometry of the hard sphere. And then we can define the total cross section. And in our case, because it's going to be independent of theta, it's just going to be four pi times r squared on four or pi r squared, which equals the uh, cross sectional area of our circle. So we think of this kind of cross-sectional area in here. That's the total cross-section, sigma. So this kind of uh, explains to us a little bit about what uh, the cross-section and the differential cross-section actually mean and how they relate to each other. So now we can move on to the quantum case. And of course, the quantum geometry means that we're going to use waves and wave functions. So we've got a continuous beam of particles moving in the z direction and some part of the beam is scattered to an angle theta. And we're thinking about elastic, elastic scattering so that the momentum of the scattered particle is not changed by the scattering. So now we can think about the wave function itself as we'll come back to, to you know, inelastic scattering much later in a few lectures time. N, some normalization constant. We've got E to the I, K, Z. That's our incoming beam. And we've got the scattered part. 
and this is going to be valid very far away from the scattering area so we want kr much much bigger than one and r very very far away from a a is like a typical size for our scattering so it's like the the radius of our hard sphere or if it's um you know some exponential drop off then it would be the you know the coefficient of the exponent so k is the wave number remember momentum equals h bar k and e is the energy of the beam and f of theta is now called the scattering amplitude and we're going to assume that f of theta does not depend on uh, phi because again uh, we're assuming that we have an axially symmetric scattering potential um, but f of theta also depends on k so we could even put a little k down there if we wanted to it just depends on the on the momentum as well so to begin with our treatment of this let's consider the probability flux or the particle flux for the beam and the scattered waves so remember this is the beam and this is the part that gets scattered so probability flux and probability density let's just remind ourselves what it is it's the probability density And we have a, uh, a flux J, or you can think of this as conservation of particles if you have many particles undergoing the same kind of event. So we've got d rho dt plus grad dot J equals zero. So that's a conservation law. And from that, you can obtain that the probability current J if you don't remember that, you should probably uh, go and look it up or um, convince yourself that's true. Make sure that you understand that with these definitions of rho and j, that you can uh, satisfy the free particle Schrodinger equation. So j is the probability current or flux. And remember the meaning of the continuity equation here. This is the continuity equation. And that's basically talking about uh, if you've got some fixed space here and you've got some, uh, if you take some, some volume, then inside it, you've got rho of r and you've got some flux of particles coming out of different parts of it, j dot da. And you can show that if you have a conservation law like this one, that d rho, dt plus grad dot j over some volume, so this is our volume v, equals zero, so that's the, the conservation law, then that's equivalent to the time dependent integral of particle density equals minus the integral of grad dot j which you can use Gauss's law to turn into the integral over the surface of j dot da so these two statements are equivalent and this is the amount of stuff that's inside some volume and this is the flux of particles coming out through the surface and so this is a conservation law for probability or a, con a conservation law for uh, particles so now we use these uh, definitions of rho and j for our uh, beam and scattered waves, respectively. So our incoming waves are in the z direction. So we can write that as k naught, uh, which is the vector part, which is the direction of z times uh, the wave number k. That's k naught the vector, and so that's k dot r. And I've missed some normalization factor because we're not really worried about that. Uh, at this stage, it applies both to the beam and the scattered waves. So using this equation, we can write that this is 
psi star. The gradient of this beam is going to be I vector K naught either the IK Z. So here what I've done is I've, I've got to take this gradient of phi. This is phi. So I take this one here and I take the gradient. That pulls out this factor of IK naught, IK naught. And then I'm just rewriting this E to the IKR as IKZ. So I'm kind of mixing, mixing these two ways of representing the wave function of the beam. And then this will be the gradient of the conjugate wave function. like so. And so this is going to give me an IK plus IK, which so I've got H bar K naught over M. There were two of them. And so that's nothing but the momentum, the initial momentum divided by the mass or the initial velocity. Now for the scalar wave, we can no longer use uh, Cartesian coordinates for grad, so we're going to have to work a little bit harder in spherical coordinates. Uh, grad phi uh, scattered is going to be... And now I'll treat each of these in turn. So we've got grad of F over R is... Remember that F does not depend on phi here. first term and the second term uh, we can actually just write like this and you should go and check these yourself make sure that you understand how to get them just go look up the gradient in spherical coordinates and then you substitute this grad psi into the expression for j and you get the scattered flux. Okay, and so you should just go and check that. Uh, make sure that you know how to do it. So we've got a scattered flux and a beam flux, and the ratio of the fluxes is So this is the differential cross section itself, and it's uh, we haven't really put in any physics yet. So this is uh, still just about the geometry. The differential cross section with these definitions of the flux, the ones that we wrote in our first ansatz for the wave function, is simply f of theta squared, and the total cross section is the integral of this differential cross-section over all solid angles. And because we're only going to have axially symmetric scattering uh, potentials, we're going to have uh, the integral over um, phi. And we can then just write this one as the integral over theta with sine theta d theta because that's the Jacobian for the solid angle. Okay, so that's about enough about the geometry for now. Um, just to recap, we've gone from this ansatz for the geometry, which is that our wave function has a incoming beam, which is a plane wave, and uh, outgoing uh, plane waves that are in spherical coordinates with some um, weighting function f of theta. And then it turns out that that f of theta if you square it, then you get the differential cross section. And then if you integrate that, you get the uh, total cross section. So this F of theta becomes the thing that we need to uh, calculate uh, in, our, in our problems. So from F of theta, which is both measurable and calculatable for a particular scattering problem, and then you can compare the two.